Okay, well, welcome everybody to the second MTS of the semester. As always, we'd like to thank the uh, Gleshko Samuelson Foundation for their generous support. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Frederick Eberhardt. Um, I My sort of cartoon history of the study of causation is that there's sort of like two watershed moments. There's Hume, and then there was Pearl and colleagues in the 80s, and Frederick is now part of the second generation after that. But he was telling me earlier it's a little more complicated than that. But nonetheless, it's very exciting work. It really is an area that's kind of exploded very recently, and I think we're witnessing that right now. Um, and he's going to tell us a little bit about, about that. Um, so Professor Eberhardt uh, did his undergrad at London School of Economics, where he got his degree in philosophy and mathematics. Uh, and then he went to Carnegie Mellon for his graduate work, where he got a master's in computer science. Um, at the Center for Causal Discovery, I think it was called at the time? Machine Learning. Machine Learning, okay. Um, and then he got his PhD at Carnegie Mellon. Um, he went on, let me consult my cheat sheet here. Uh, he did a postdoc in psychology at UC Berkeley, and then he was in the uh, PNP program at WashU, and now he's a faculty member at Caltech. And today he'll be telling us about causation versus correlation in human and machine learning. Please join me in welcoming Professor Eberhardt. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jeff, for having me. Um, I'm, I've had a really good day talking to many of you already. And so I hope that uh, throughout this talk, we can continue talking and asking questions about the things that I'm presenting. This is perhaps somewhat left field for you. I hope to give you, uh, Jeff put it this way, he said, give me an introduction to causality, tell me what, it's cutting, what is cutting edge, also say something about applications and what you're working on right now. So we'll be here in four hours, okay, we're ready. But, uh, but, but more seriously, there will be a lot of stuff I'm talking about, something might uh, 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 not make as much sense to you. I have been in the trenches of this causal discovery work for so long that I've kind of lost uh, some of the uh, perspective on it. Again, stop me, ask, especially clarification questions. Uh, when I'm in the audience, I can't stand when I don't understand something on slide two, and it's a really trivial thing to clear up. So uh, please don't hesitate to interrupt, and uh, you know, if it's the real zinger, I'll maybe uh, you know, take it offline later. Right? So let's, let's see how we go. Anyway, what, I walk, what I'm going to talk to you about today is very close to my heart. This is what I spent my day on at uh, Caltech, um, on trying to identify or what we can say about the difference between causation and correlation and under what circumstances we might be able to tell when we're looking at an actual causal relation or when we're just looking at a spurious correlation. So the whole motivation for this type of work uh, you see every day in your newspaper or in, on your website that you might, or, or your blogs that you might be reading, here are some samples that uh, someone else actually gathered up, uh, where you might notice that the word causation doesn't really appear anywhere, and yet everything uh, uh, suggests a causal relation or hints at the causal relation that the word cause has become the casualty in, in uh, these headlines, and it's replaced with links, connected to, increases, or something like that. And with some cases, you might think there is a more obvious causal relation, like the first one, caffeine reverses memory impairment in mice with Alzheimer's symptoms. You think, oh yeah, there was probably an experiment or some randomized controlled trial. And when you think about the causal relation of the purple, when the study suggests that southern slavery turns white people into Republicans 150 years later, <laughs> you just wonder, well, okay, what exactly is uh, the causal link here? Is this supposed to be a causal link? How could we know about it? So what I want to suggest with these types of headlines, and there are many more like this, is that uh, we really want to think uh, about how we should learn about causal relation. What are the methods that we can develop to detect and say which ones of these, what data would we need to actually establish uh, any of these claims as causal claims. Um, and so in that sense, I think it's actually quite hard to think of scientific disciplines that don't touch on the question of causation or worry about both uh, uh, how one might learn about the uh, uh, causal aspects of what's going on there, which is not to say, I mean, arguing for the mathematics professors that he's really working on causation is perhaps a little bit Okay, the contrast to this type of question, this normative question of how should we uh, think about causal relations is 
Well, uh, as humans, we're rather good at learning causal relations. How do we actually do it? This is uh, the work of psychologists and cognitive scientists. Perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps some of you are working on this. Is that as we grow up, we're uh, we seem to be very able to discover causal relations. We manage to detect them. It's, uh, perhaps you might wonder, are there certain types of standard mistakes that we make in uh, our uh, causal inferences as we grow up? And uh, uh, can we get a better understanding of how this developmental aspect of causal learning um, occurs? And can we contrast that type of causal learning that we have in humans with other animals? Do other animals exhibit causal learning? What would it take to show that they are not just learning associations? Um, and people have looked at experiments concerning, in, in particular, uh, dogs and rats. And uh, I've always hoped that I could convince the people working on corvids, uh, to, so um, uh, ravens, to uh, do some experiments that would really detect whether they are very good at building tools and uh, processing mechanisms, or whether they can actually detect some type of uh, do some type of causal inference as well. If you think rats obviously know how to do uh, causal inference, they live all over the place. Well, is the same true for flies, uh, or do they uh, just do, does all their life uh, succeed on the basis of just association and learning? This is uh, actually. Um, material from a fly lab at Caltech, so this is something that we're actively looking at. Okay, so on the one hand we have the question of how should we learn about causal relations, and then on the other hand is how do we, how do animals, how do uh, other creatures learn about uh, causal relations, if at all. So uh, naturally it's uh, always the question that haunts me and that uh, uh, philosophers uh, uh, some at least uh, want to answer in some kind of clean way is that, well, if you're going to talk about causality, tell me first what it is. Right? And we're in not such a good position for that because uh, the big guys uh, have uh, uh, poured a lot of cold water on this concept. So Bertrand Russell said that all philosophers, like me, imagine that causation is one of the fundamental axioms of science, yet oddly enough in advanced sciences, the word cause never occurs. The law of causality, Russell believes, is a relic of a bygone, area, uh, uh, bygone age surviving like the monarchy only because it is erroneously assumed not to do harm. Okay. So uh, basically Russell's point is that, well, if you look at fundamental physics or the uh, latest um, uh, theories in physics, you don't see uh, the term causality crop up. Uh, that should make you nervous about whether cause, uh, causality is really a fundamental concept that we should think of is part of our scientific toolbox. Um, and Russell suggests it's not. So we're in for an uphill battle. And the uphill battle is made even starker by uh, one of the great statisticians, Carl Pearson, of the Neyman Pearson framework for probability, who said that beyond such discarded fundamentals as matter and force lies still another fetish amidst the inscrutable arcana of modern science, namely the category of cause and effect. Okay, so what is causality? Uh, uh, these guys did not think much of causality. In fact, I think uh, with regard to Carl Pearson, the news might have been, uh, his, his influence might have been so strong that his views uh, against causality have kept the concept of causality out of statistics for far too long. And that uh, uh, really, um, it's only been over the last perhaps 30 or so years that it's come back and uh, been taken seriously as a concept in statistics as well. Okay, it doesn't help. So, so Jeff mentioned this earlier that you know we there were what two events in your history of causality. <laughs> uh, here's one. Then uh, it doesn't help if Hume gave one definition of causality as it's saying we may define a cause to be an object followed by another, and where all the objects similar to the first are followed by objects similar to the second. Now, okay. A cause, uh, sorry, an effect might be followed. Sorry, the effect, a cause might be followed by its effect. But of course, Hume already knew that uh, lightning doesn't cause thunder, right? So if you have some uh, common cause of the two, where one of the um, cause, one of the effects is delayed to a greater extent than the other, then you're still satisfying, at least in this very superficial reading of Hume, you're still satisfying exactly his definition. Yet, uh, we wouldn't say that x is a cause of y, or that uh, um, uh, thunder, uh, lightning is a cause of thunder. And so, 
uh, there's work to be done in trying to get a grip on what exactly we mean by causality. I want to, uh, uh, and, and the, the obvious uh, example is of course, well, you can make lightning or you can try and uh, uh, flash an enormous light and it's not going to roar a thunder after that, right? So uh, if you intervene to bring about the lightning, then uh, by, by flashing a bright light, then it's not going to result in thunder. Okay, so uh, I don't want to give you a definition of causation, I want to work on your intuitions that you might have for causation and then see whether I can put those together into a framework that will work more like an axiomatization of causation rather than as a definition of causation. So as an analogy, analogy keep in mind something like the axiomatization of probability. We have the axioms, the Kolmogorov axioms of probability. They don't define what probability is. They don't tell you that probability is our degrees of belief or limits of infinite or the limit of an infinite frequency. Um, so, uh, in the yet they that the axioms, the axiomatization that Kolmogorov offered, uh, provides a useful tool to think and work with probability. So, in the same way, I want to suggest to you. Think for the moment as causation in terms of invariance under intervention. What do I mean by that? I mean by that something like the gadget here on the left is a barometer. I know you all have this on your phone these days, uh, so do I, but uh, in the olden days, uh, we all had a barometer on the wall still at home that would measure the pressure, and the pressure, uh, uh, the measurement of the barometer would be an extremely good predictor of the weather tomorrow. Um, but it was a good predictor because the atmospheric pressure called, had an influence on the weather tomorrow and the atmospheric pressure had a, an influence on the, uh, the barometer reading today. But of course the barometer reading is not a cause of the weather tomorrow because if I intervened to manipulate the barometer needle, or in your case if I intervened to set your phone to read something different about its prediction for the weather tomorrow, I'm not influencing the weather. That is, my intervention here on the barometer needle breaks the connection between what brings about the barometer reading and the uh, uh, weather tomorrow. So under intervention, the uh, barometer is no longer a good predictor for the weather tomorrow. Therefore, it's not a cause. Right? So causation uh, uh, or the causal relation is one that holds even under intervention. Of course, my barometer reading is a cause of whether I take my umbrella with me tomorrow. Right? So if I change the reading of the barometer, I may or may not take the umbrella with me. So it's not as if uh, manipulating the barometer needle isn't a cause of anything. And similarly, the idea of invariance under intervention is supposed to be sufficiently broadly construed that it's not actually interventions that I can do in fact, but that we can think of as hypothetical interventions. So I would want to say, well, if I could bring the volcano to erupt, then that might have an effect on the weather tomorrow. In that sense, the eruption of the volcano is a cause of the weather tomorrow. Right? That's the thought. So it's invariance. Causation is supposed to be something that's invariant under intervention, where the notion of intervention is rather broadly construed. It's not obvious at all how I do this type of intervention on the volcano. OK. So, Here's then a definition that uh, Jim Woodward suggested in his book for the definition of a, uh, a cause. Um, it doesn't uh, work, it's not completely flawless, but I think it picks up on the intuitions I was suggesting. He says that X is a cause of Y if there is an intervention on X that changes Y or its probability distribution while all other variables are held fixed by an intervention. So if you read this uh, from a philosophical standpoint, then this is a disastrous uh, definition because it reduces the notion of causation to one of intervention. And now tell me what an intervention is with talk, without talking about causation. It sounds like you're going around in the loop. Right? So that's why I'm saying it's as a definition, it's not a particularly good one, yet it seems to, I think, capture a lot of the intuitions. And for now, or for today, I'm not going to argue about the definitions. I just want you to have a good sense of when I continue to talk about cause in the rest of the talk, this is the kind of idea that I'm talking about. It's this type of invariance under intervention. So X is a cause of Y here because if I wiggle X while I hold W fixed at some value, then I'll, have, uh, I'll see a response in the probability distribution. That's the thought. That's the kind of relation that I want to discuss. 
Okay, so going back then to these headlines, you might say, well, this is precisely what made us uncomfortable about uh, uh, interpreting some of these as more causal or not. So the first one, I think, we can very easily imagine an intervention there. We say that, well, you do some randomized controlled trial with caffeine, and you, you measure the uh, uh, effect on memory. With sincere smiling promotes longevity, right? You might say, well, here the intervention is actually quite difficult, right? So you can make yourself smile, but remember, it's only sincere smiling that causes longevity. So if you don't live very long, you are just not sincere. Right? So, uh, if I demand now the intervention of sincere smiling, then uh, it's, it's not obvious how one would do it. And so you might wonder, well, in what sense can we talk about this as really a cause of uh, longevity? Similarly, with eating fatty fish lowers the risk of dimen uh, dementia. Well, what are we worried about here? We can imagine very well what the intervention is, right? Eat some more fatty fish, eat less fatty fish. Um, the worry is that we might think that the study that this was taken from was maybe in a population of people where a lot of fatty fish was part of the diet anyway, right? And so you're worried about, well, is this, an in, uh, uh, is this claim a result of interventional data, or is this claim a result of something where the data might be confounded by other factors? Okay. And so I think having this notion of causation as invariance under intervention very quickly locates why you might be comfortable with saying, oh yeah, that was, sounds more like a causal claim, or something else does not sound. So I have already uh, used this representation scheme in several of the previous slides, and I want to make it a little bit more explicit of why I think this idea that uh, uh, Jeff pointed to as the second event in this history of, of uh, uh, causation is the, the um, development of causal graphical models by Judea Pearl and the group of uh, people around Peter Spirtis, Clark Kim, and uh, Richard Chinas at uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, why this is a useful tool to think about uh, causal relations. So what can we represent? We have variables, in this case, say, wine consumption and uh, cardiovascular disease or heart disease, um, and we are worried about whether there is a causal link between them. Well, we can represent that by a directed arrow. Remember, what I mean by the directed arrow is that if you manipulated in an experiment the amount of wine consumption, then you would have seen an effect. You would see a change in the amount of heart disease. Now, you won't get that, that past the IRB of your university, it's more of mine, but uh, that, that's the conceptual idea behind it. That we can also represent uh, the idea of confounding very easily. So it might be that socioeconomic status is thought to be a confounder because higher socioeconomic status has greater wine consumption maybe and uh, higher socioeconomic status might afford the fitness studio, healthcare, whatever it is that uh, lowers the risk in heart disease. Easy to represent, this is a confounder. It caused, it's a common cause of the two uh, variables we're observing. We might have unmeasured confounders. We could represent these like this. We can also represent something of an intervention. We say, here's a particular policy that we're introducing. And the idea of the policy is that it controls how much wine drinking there is. And by fully con if the policy fully controls how much wine drinking there is, then it breaks the causal influences from the unmeasured confounders, as well as from the uh, uh, measured confounders, such as socioeconomic status. Note that this is precisely what the statistician Ronald Fisher had in mind when he said this is why we want to do randomized controlled trials for, uh, the, for causal discovery. It's because we want to randomize the, in this case, wine drinking, and see whether there's actually any effect on heart disease, because at least in the large sample limit, the idea would be that randomization would make the uh, intervened variable independent of its normal cause. Okay, and then if there is in fact a dependence between the two under uh, an experiment, then uh, we might say that there is a cause. Okay. More on the causal graphical model aspect. We have a set of variables. We can talk about a direct causal link between the variables, an indirect causal link between the variables, or an indirect and a direct causal link between the variables. Right? So does a causal influence bypass the variable Y or not? Does it go through variable Y? Does it do both? That's, that, that's the idea. We can talk about confounders. And then the idea is that together with the causal model, with, the, with this type of graphical representation, we have a probability distribution over the set of variables. And the probability distribution is supposed to be uh, uh, represent how the data was generated from this type of causal structure. So overall, the idea is that 
Underlying out there in the world, I can represent the causal relations between the variables w, x, y, and z in terms of this graph, and then I have a distribution of how the data is generated that, uh, from this type of causal structure. Moreover, in, in this particular causal structure, you might notice, or you could maybe see it from the distribution, that what we have is that W and Z are independent given X and Y. So there's a particular independence constraint that is present in the distribution and that is present in the causal structure. That's the suggestion. In that sense, matching these types of independence and dependence constraints, that's the idea of that the generative distribution has to somehow match the causal structure. Okay. In fact, when we do our research, we might not observe W. We might just observe X, Y, and Z. In that case, the observed distributions or distribution over my variables X, Y, and Z is just the marginal uh, I sum W up. Now, I say observed distribution. Of course, what we observe is the data, and we infer from the data the distribution. And finally, then, in the causal model, the idea is that we can talk about what does the causal model look like under intervention? If I do an experiment, for example, I control Y, then how does the generative distribution of the data that I would see normally change when I do an experiment on, that, on, the, on, the, um, on one particular variable? And so in particular, what we would see in this case is that because we fully control Y in the experiment, X and Y would become independent. Uh, yeah, X and Y would become independent. There's no causal connection, and then therefore no dependence anymore between uh, X and Y. If you're getting lost, the big picture is that the causal model is supposed to represent the causal structure, and it's supposed to represent how the data is generated, both observationally in an observational study and in, under different experiments. That's the key idea. And so this representation in terms of the directed graph and the probability distributions is supposed to tie these different parts together. That's, that's what we want to Any questions? I'm sure there are lots of questions, so you could, you could ask them now, or you could put yourself to sleep chewing on those questions for a while. But uh, I'll, I'll, I hope that someone will have the guts at some point to ask the question, because I'm sure there are things that have, uh, that have not been clear. Anyway, I'll, I'll continue on and hope for us. Actually, yeah. good question. Um, you mentioned the independence of W and Z in your model. Yeah. Um, could you speak a little bit more to that? Because it seems to me that there's plenty of error connecting that. Ah, yeah. But it's W and Z are independent given X and Y. Oh, okay. So, so, let, so me, let me tell you what I mean. What I mean is that you know the value of Z. You want to know the value uh, uh, um, you want to predict the, well, let's go the other way. You know the value of W, you want to predict the value of Z. Uh, then um, the value of W becomes irrelevant when I tell you the value of X and Y. I see. In that sense, and so you can see it maybe, maybe intuitively this way, is that any directed path from W to Z gets blocked by the conditioning set. So here or here. There. Right. That's, that's, uh, the idea. So, in converse, in the late leader example, x is not independent of y when conditioned on z. Ah, yes, but you picked up a tricky one. Yeah. Yes, but you're absolutely right. But that's the tricky one. So, my point here was that x and y are independent. I don't have a directed path between them, right? But what you correctly pointed out is you said, well, conditional on Z, now I'm opening a dependence through the common effect. This is actually not completely obvious, and actually a lot of uh, statisticians, philosophers, got this wrong for many, many years. But it turns out if you condition on something that is a common effect of two variables, then you actually induce, an in the, uh, 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 you induce the dependence. And that's precisely what you're pointing out. Thank you. Um, so the important thing to note down here is that the intervened distribution is different from the conditional distribution. And so one of the big innovations, I think, for uh, by Julia Pearl has been that is this introduction of the do operator into the standard probability calculus, 
which represents the idea that I'm not conditioning on the variable as you do with uh, conditional probability standardly. I'm doing an intervention on the variable. And that has quite a different effect. Uh, so in particular, conditional on y, um, uh, we, we wouldn't break, be breaking this arrow right there between, uh, no, well, we wouldn't be breaking either arrow uh, between, uh, between the variables. Okay, so um, what's then the overall picture of causal discovery? The thought is that whatever causal relations are out there in the world, I'm able to represent them so the claim goes in terms of a graphical model, that is a graphical structure um, uh, with a directed graph and a probability distribution. From that, I generate a sample. That's what I observe. That's what the scientist gets. And I now want to have some type of inference algorithm, some type of discovery algorithm, that under a certain set of well-specified assumptions tells me something about the underlying unknown um, um, causal structure. So in particular, it might tell me that well, I know it's one of these two structures, or maybe a subset of one of these two structures, but I don't know exactly what the true causal structure is. Or in this case, I'm trying to suggest that if you have, for example, a linear model, you might be uh, able to estimate edge coefficients between, uh, for any particular causal connection between the variables, but you might not be able to estimate all of them. So you might say, for some of them, I just don't know whether there's an edge between the variables or not. So the task of causal discovery is then to say that under what circumstances and under what assumptions can I build a connection between the output of a discovery algorithm, algorithm and what might be there underlying the, uh, my data that is the generating causal structure. And in order to build that type of connection, I have to say something about, well, what exactly connects the data sample that I observe to the underlying causal structure? And so now we get to what is driving the idea of causal discovery, these types of axioms that connect, um, the, uh, the, that allow the inference algorithms to infer something from the data about the underlying causal structure. The idea is that from the data, I can estimate, I can ship the data to a statistician who knows what they're doing, and they can estimate independencies and conditional independencies and dependencies for me very easily. I want to now say these types of independence and dependence constraints constrain the causal structure. I'm now going to develop an idea of graphical connection um, that allows me to say, okay, if I see X and Y are independent given Z and W, then that implies something about how they can be graphically connected in the underlying causal structure. And the key idea here that goes back to um, I, uh, um, uh, Geiger and Pearl is uh, the idea of deseparation. I won't give you the uh, definition of deseparation, but suffice it to say that deseparation and deconnection specify a type of uh, connection within this graph. And so when you have uh, a deseparation as represented by the single turnstile here, then that means that it's a particular type of separation of how the variables can be connected in this graph. That, that's the overall idea. And so there are two conditions that hook up the probabilistic independence and dependence structure with the graphical connectivity structure that you'd have for the underlying uh, causal graph. This type of connectivity constraint that you obtain from the probabilistic independence and dependence constraints underdetermines the causal structure. That's why you get, in general, an equivalence class of causal structures out of your causal discovery algorithm. It won't say, oh, you've given me this data, here's the causal graph that generated this data. It will be, you give me this data, here are, here is the set of possible graphs that generated the data. And that set, of course, we hope is much smaller and <coughs> than, the, than the trivial uh, set that includes all possible graphs. But similarly, of course, we know that independence and dependence constraints vastly underdetermine the type of information that you can get out of the probability distribution. So if you're willing to look at more features of the probability distribution, then you might use that additional information to further constrain the equivalence class of cost graphs. And I say a little, I'll say a little bit more about that. So the key 
axioms, you can almost say, that uh, uh, do the work in causal discovery are these uh, principles that connect features of the probability distribution, in this case, independence and dependence constraints, to graphical connectivity constraints. And so the Markov and faithfulness assumptions are the, the central assumptions, or, or at least are a very easy set to start with to get a sense of how this works. Now I'll tell you what those are. OK. The causal Markov assumption says that for any variable x that you have in your data set, it is independent of its non-descendants given its parents in the causal graph. So I've color-coded them accordingly with the graph on the right. Um, x is independent of any of the, what is this, magenta variables uh, given its parents in the causal graph. So the idea here is that if you knew the causal structure, what the causal Markov assumption allows you to say, it, it allows you to um, conclude a certain set of independencies from uh, the data, that, uh, uh, from the causal structure that you have. Conversely, if you see a certain set of dependencies, that allows you to say something about how the variables have to be connected in the causal graph. Now, I think it's always important, it's an assumption, it's a substantive assumption, so let's think about when it fails. The causal Markov assumption is a peculiar one in the sense that there are lots of failures of the causal Markov assumption in application, which we can put down to a model misspecification. So if you somehow measure your variables incorrectly, if you omit uh, latent variables, or um, if you discretize variables too coarsely, that shouldn't be discretized so coarsely. All of these are the bracketed uh, violations of the causal Markov assumption because basically I think you got something wrong in your processing of the data and once you fix that then you don't have a violation of the causal Markov assumption anymore. The case is different in quantum mechanics. So in the, for example, in the EPR experiment, the einstein podolsky rosen experiment, there are features, there are correlations there that you cannot explain in terms of the causal Markov assumption. Uh, you, they violate the causal Markov assumption. And so there are two ways that you can look at that type of setting then is to say that, well, either you're not looking at a causal situation or there are causal situations that don't uh, satisfy the mark of assumption. Well, pick your poison in a certain sense. Okay, moving on. The causal faithfulness, in a way, is the converse of the causal mark of assumption. It says that x is independent of y given a condition in set C in the probability distribution, if that's the case, then x is de-separated from y given the condition in set in the graph. What does this mean? It basically says that if you have a certain independence or conditional independence uh, that you detect in your data, then that allows you to infer a certain separation between your variables um, in the graph. Again, I think it's worthwhile asking when does this fail? So uh, in contrast to causal Markov, causal faithfulness, field is, is more of a simplicity assumption. It can feel if you have a system where there are two causal pathways, but they cancel out exactly. So here I'm suggesting that suppose we have a linear model and y is minus a b times x plus, and then now this causal path, it would turn out that the, well, for those of you who are familiar with linear models, the, the, the correlations along, or the dependencies along these paths would cancel out exactly, right? So in that case, you would have x and y to be independent of one another, despite the fact that they are causally connected twice, in fact, through two pathways. That's a violation of the causal Markovism. But the cancellation, of course, has to be exact. Otherwise, it's not a violation of the Markovism. So you can ask how reasonable that is. How often do we have cases where paths cancel exactly? And you might say, well, that's not particularly often. Or you might say, well, in fact, if you have backup mechanisms, you might have canceling paths quite often. And so then you would have a case where the uh, um, faithfulness assumption is violated uh, um, in, in your data. The point for faithfulness, uh, uh, so the point to the claim that the distribution is faithful to the graph is a simplicity assumption. It basically says that when you see an independence then between two variables, then there cannot be a causal connection. That's, that's what it's supposed to do. Okay, 
So now let me get you some results on the table here. So if we assume causal Markov and causal faithfulness, and if we, in addition, for the sake of argument, I just want to keep it very simple, assume causal sufficiency, which says that there are no unmeasured common causes, so by the dashed arrows I'm suggesting variables that are unmeasured uh, in our data set, and here we have a common cause of two variables. Um, so if we don't have those in our data set, and you say, okay, well then, causal inference is very easy. Fine, it is easy, but let's, let's just get that, that easy case done. And if we don't have feedback loops, I know you're all thinking, well, my, my systems all have feedback loops, so this is, uh, I know, it's a simple case. I'm making strong assumptions, let's, let's see what we get out of that. So, no, no feedback cycles in your, in your causal model, no latent variables, and you're assuming causal mark of causal faithfulness. What can we discover about the causal relation? Well, it turns out that all causal structures in an equivalence class, if, you've, if you make those assumptions, they share the same adjacencies. That means two variables are adjacent uh, in all the members of uh, one equivalence class. And they share the same, same unshielded colliders. What is, that? is an unshielded collider? Why is an unshielded collider? Because it's a common effect of two variables which don't have an edge between them. Okay? Now that's, I think, a fairly strong result already. So you've made only those assumptions. And what you get out is that you can develop a causal discovery algorithm that is guaranteed in the large sample limit to give you an equivalence class which already tells you all the adjacencies between the variables and all the uh, unshielded colliders, so all the substructures that look like this. Um, uh, that's not obvious, and so I want to give you an example of, of what this looks like. For three variables, there are 25 graphs drawn here that um, satisfy those assumptions, no cycles, um, no latent variables. Okay. And now we can ask, well, what does that equivalence class that I suggested on the previous slide look like? Looks like this. What this means is that under just these assumptions up here, we know that in the equivalence class that you can discover uh, using a causal discovery algorithm, all the um, graphs in one equivalence class share the same adjacencies, such as this equivalence class here. They just have the uh, YZ adjacency. Okay. Note here that we've got one graph on its own in an equivalence class. Right? The bad news is down here. There are six graphs that are all together in one equivalence class. They should share the same adjacencies and they share the same unshielded colliders. In this case, there are no unshielded colliders. <coughs> So um, what that means is that with a fairly straightforward discovery algorithm, you could reduce your set of 25 possible causal graphs over your three variables to somewhere between six and only one uh, graph. Very concretely, let's do it this way. Suppose in your data you had found that x is independent of y. You could then delete all the equivalence classes that don't satisfy that constraint given causal, uh, causal faithfulness and causal markup. Got. Then you find that x is dependent with z. Well, in that case, I have to take all the ones out that have an xz edge. Oh, they are all gone. Sorry, I have to take all the ones out that don't have a dependence. And suppose finally I find in my data that y is dependent on z. I can take out those two remaining graphs. With just these three independence tests for my three variables, I've uniquely discovered the causal structure without doing a single experiment. This was only observational data. And so people often ask me, is that, well, okay, you do causal discovery, so you're interested in doing experiments. And I'm no. We can actually discover causal structure without doing a single experiment. Here's an example. And we uniquely discover the causal structure. Okay, maybe we were lucky in this case, right? Because in general, the equivalence classes weren't single. But it's certainly possible to discover causal structure, including the orientation of the edges from uh, just observational data. But of course, you're making assumptions. And then you can ask yourself whether those assumptions are better or whether you'd rather invest in the experiment. Okay. That's the that's the thing. OK. This I just said. So those three tests were sufficient to determine the equivalence class, in this case, a single uh, graph. Perhaps even better, then, is to say, well, how does this generalize? And so here's how it generalizes. This is the first kind of limitation result, is that 
For linear Gaussian and for multinomial causal relations, that's a particular parametric form, and I can describe it later if you're interested, but just take it as a particular parametric form. An algorithm that identifies the Markov equivalence class of the true model is complete. That is to say, if you know that your causal model is either described by a multinomial distribution or by a linear Gaussian model, there is nothing more to discover in your data, no matter how much data you collect, than what can be identified in the Markov equivalence class. That means you have to strengthen your assumptions or you have to do experiments if you want to find out which causal graph is true within the uh, Markov equivalence. So you can take this as good news is that well, if you've got an algorithm for me that identifies the Markov equivalence class, then you've got all the information out of your data that you can get out of your data, given those assumptions. And, or you can take it as bad news and say, we're stuck with Markov equivalence classes. So if you end up with a larger Markov equivalence class, then uh, um, uh, what, you, you have to strengthen your assumptions and do some experiments. That's, that's the kind of gist of this type of uh, result. Okay. There are people who have de uh, developed these types of algorithms, and so I just want to give you an application of an algorithm that makes exactly those types of assumptions that is complete with regard to the Markov equivalence class, and I want to suggest what people have done with, with it. This is not my work. Um, this is by a group at ETH in Zurich, but I think it's a really, really nice uh, example of an application of causal discovery algorithms. They had gene expression data, observational, uh, um, gene expression data for this flower, uh, it's Arabidopsis thaliana, um, and they, in addition to the gene expression data which was just collected from many samples, uh, they had uh, um, uh, phenotypic data in terms of when the flower flowered, so onset of flower. Um, and so they took this data and basically pumped this through one of the causal discovery algorithms that works exactly under the assumptions that I specified for you uh, above. It's called the IDA algorithm. I'm only giving you a, a, a scheme of what they did, but I think you'll get the sense. What they then had was an equivalence class of causal structures uh, where you had lots and lots of uh, um, possible genes that were supposed to affect um, or that, that the algorithm suggested affected the onset of flower, okay, for the, for the plant. And then they said, okay, well, we'll use this knowledge of the suggested causal structure in terms of what we got in the, uh, the equivalence class to rank the candidate genes of which they thought had the strongest effect on the onset of flowering, on the phenotypic variant. Okay? And so in particular, you might look at this graph this is not their graph, this is something that I drew. You might look at this graph and say, well, U and V are way better than taking X and certainly better than taking Z or W to predict onset of flower, right? Because they are the direct causes. Okay, using those, they then went to their biologist colleagues and said that, knock out those genes and do the experiment to confirm what, uh, uh, whether you have an effect on flowering. So they ranked them. And you know there are a lot of genes. I think they were they started off with something like 20,000 genes down sampled, and in the end had like a ranking of I think on the order of tens of genes. And they took the top 20, I think, and did knockout experiments. I might have the numbers slightly wrong. And did an experiment and actually planted the plants with a knockout gene, and then found indeed that they could confirm for several not all of them, but for several of these uh, genes that they thought were candidates or good candidates to affect flowering, they did indeed find that they did affect flowering. And so it was an analysis on the basis of observational data to discover what the causes of the onset of flowering were, and then it was checking with the ground truth by actually planting and watering these plants and seeing them. I think this is really nice work because it goes the whole way from the observational data all the way through to a causal conclusion and then confirms it. That's, that's, uh, ultimately, the intervention might be the, the lacmus test of whether you've got a causal conclusion. Okay. Um, another way, uh, so that was just a high level on the application. Another way that I want to suggest to you if you're getting depressed with this type of result is to say that, well, okay, you want to do better than the equivalence class of 
uh, causal structures, you want to find something that's within the equivalence class of causal structures. You want to know what's going on. And so, um, what are your options? Well, you could weaken your assumptions and then the equivalence class is just going to get larger. That's not, not going to be such good news. Or you could exclude the limitations of the theorem that I just told you. So you could say, well, it was the linear Gaussian models or it was the multinomial models. Can I perhaps consider a different parameterization of the causal system and thereby avoid the limitations that I have that I get this under determination of the uh, uh, in the Markov equivalence class? Or I might say, well, maybe we can integrate lots of different data sets from all sorts of sources, from all sorts of labs, and see what we can get out of it by, by um, combining those data sets and uh, um, inferring what can be done from, about the uh, causal structure from the joint set of data. Okay, I want to focus on this middle case for just a moment because I want to show you some, how some very nice work on this uh, uh, um, causal discovery using these using a slight tweak in the assumptions can have a huge effect on what we can discover. Okay, this is what I'm worried about. It says here for linear Gaussian, la la la, a causal relations, an algorithm that identifies the Markov equivalence class of the true model is complete. That is to say, if your if each variable in your causal model is a linear sum of the values of its parents plus a Gaussian error term then the Markov equivalence class is as good as it gets in terms of your discovery procedure. So, uh, as, as uh, good logicians, just negate that Gaussian part okay, and see what happens. Here are, here's the linear Gaussian system. Okay? The, the, each variable is a linear sum with some coefficient of its parents plus a, uh, an error term. Suppose that this error term is anything but Gaussian. So just don't give me a normal distribution, okay? Then the true graph, the true causal structure is uniquely identifiable from the joint distribution. It's a remarkable result if you think about it. it it's basically saying that all you need to do in uh, inverted commas is to ensure that your system that you're analyzing has this type of functional form with an independent error which is non-Gaussian. And by remember, it, I'm just saying not Gaussian. It can be anything but Gaussian. So, so it can be um, uniform or it can be some type of asymmetric distribution. It doesn't matter. Um, as long as it's not Gaussian, I get the true causal graph. I can uniquely identify the true causal graph. For those of you who are working in neuroscience, this is actually the result that underlies independent component analysis. So I see it. Uh, that, that, that's, that's what's doing the work there as well. So let me give you a little bit of intuition for that type of identifiability, just in terms of two, uh, the two variable case. Two variables, x and y. Here's, here's the uh, linear relation with an um, uh, error term. We're assuming that the error terms are non-Gaussian. Non, uh, non um, and in this causal model, uh, don't worry about how you would estimate this, but if you could see this causal model, you would see that x should be independent of the residuals on y. Uh, that's, that's, what, that's, uh, uh, that's what the independence relations are supposed to be under Markov and faithfulness. In the backwards model, so if I fit the causal arrow in the reverse direction, um, I would have that y is independent of the residuals on x. Okay? Now, the only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this equation, um, substituting in this equation. So it's, I've just, if you go through, it's just a simple substitution of what's going on here. But now, notice that I've got two linear equations in x and epsilon y. x and epsilon y here, and x and epsilon y here. And I've got y and epsilon x here, and that those two are supposed to be independent. Okay. So what's going on? Here are the two equations again. Here's the key theorem. It's the Darmaskitovich theorem that drives this type of identifiability result. It says that let x1 to xn be independent non-degenerate non random variables. If none of the xi are normally distributed, then the two linear combinations L1 and L2 are dependent. 
So what does that mean for our case? We assumed for the correct model, x was supposed to be independent of epsilon y. Right? So and x was supposed to be the independent of the residual on y. I'll show you here. This is what I said right here. x is supposed to be independent of the residual on y. And then um, I've got a linear combination of the two. I know that x and epsilon y are non-Gaussian, because all my error terms were non-Gaussian. Okay? So that means if, uh, if none of the xi are normally distributed, then the two linear combinations, the y and this guy here, are supposed to be dependent. But, whoops, but in the backwards model, those were supposed to be independent. So that means I can tell which way around the causal arrow goes. So I can check whether I get an independence between y and the residual on x or between x and the residual on y. And depending on which way around I get the independence, that tells me which way uh, the, the I have to fit them on. So I fit it both ways and then check for that independence. It's a very, very nice result. And uh, it basically underlies this result of unique identifiability that I spoke to before. There are many, many, so, so I suspect that Basically, I'd be happy if you get out of this, that there's something, uh, a very weak assumption gives you enormous discovery power. If you take that away, then you can just look at the references later and figure it out yourself, uh, um, what's going on. <coughs> um, there are enormous, an enormous array of different assumptions that you can tweak and change uh, that have given rise to a whole pile of different algorithms. And so this is my slide of trying to persuade you by just throwing too much at you so that you can't process it. Uh, so the idea here is, if you ever go back to this slide, is that we've got different assumptions that you can make along the y-axis. And we've got different types of algorithms with all their curious acronyms along the x-axis up here. And I tell you in each column what assumptions they make and then in the bottom row, I tell you what can be discovered uh, about the underlying causal structure there. And of course, there are lots of acronyms here as well, so let me tell you what I've talked about today, is I showed you the Markov equivalence class, right, case, and I showed you this case of the linear non-Gaussian, where you get the unique directed acyclic graph, the unique causal structure part. And so, depending on what assumptions you like and you want to sign up to in your specific setting, you might look for a, a particular algorithm that works well for that setting. And then you can find out what exactly you might discover about the uh, true causal structure from that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have another two or three minutes, maybe? Okay. I want to, I, uh, this is to fulfill the request that I want to say something about uh, what I've been working on recently that I think. Um, may be of interest to you as well. I've been telling this story, and actually someone earlier today already asked me uh, exactly about this point. I've been telling this story as if we already know what the relevant variables are, right? So I've been drawing all these graphs, the variables have been meaningful in terms of, well, more or less meaningful. Socioeconomic status perhaps is not uh, quite so clear what it is. Uh, wine drinking, I know what it is. Uh, so, but, but I've, I've given you, I've started from a statistical data set where I have meaningful variables that I want to discover the causal relations for. Um, my concern for a long time was that, well, how do we construct these types of variables in the first place? So, an example of it is that, consider this image here, it's pixelated, it's supposed to be a hundred digit of a three. Um, in pixelated form, and that seeing that image in you created some type of uh, raster of your neuron, or you, some type of firing in your brain, of uh, neurons in your brain, and I'm just schematically representing that in terms of a running average of uh, neural raster. So these are firing rates of a whole bunch of neurons in your brain. And now I want to know what is the cause of you recognizing a three in this. Okay? And I want to say, well, I want to have recognition be some type of macro variable that supervenes on your neurons firing in some particular way. So how well, the, the whole set of tools that I've given you so far doesn't say anything about 
how do I build up the causal variable? Am I going to take every pixel here that can be on and off as an individual causal variable? That can be a, a cause for any one of the neurons that is represented by one line in the raster? That doesn't seem like the right way. We want to say it's some type of macro scale feature of the image that causes some macro scale uh, that makes you see a three and by seeing a three what goes on is some macro scale feature in how your neurons fire that constitute recognition of uh, the three in the picture. Another example if you don't like this one is here is data of a geographical region in the equatorial Pacific, think of the um, coast of the Americas along this side here and the, you know, um, um, the Philippines and Indonesia along this side here and this is a band of the Pacific and I've measured wind patterns in this uh, region. So the darker green it is, the more the wind goes to the west. And what I'm interested in is the effect of the wind patterns on temperature patterns. So here I've got for the same geographical region the sea surface temperature pattern. And so why are we interested in that? Because one of the macro level climate phenomena that actually in California we care a lot about is El Nino. El Nino at the moment is defined by climatologists as this particular, as an, uh, um, uh, as an average beyond a certain threshold value of the temperature in this particular region. Okay. Now, how, how did they come up with that? They said, okay, well, let's draw, the, the, this, this seems to be where the relevant stuff is happening. Um, and so, uh, uh, we want to, we, we should basically take the average of this region and then take that as an indicator of El Nino occurring. But there's another way of thinking of it. There's another way of saying that, well, no, El Nino is a macro variable in the climate, uh, in the climate as it is. Maybe we can discover it. Maybe we can actually build up the El Nino variable at looking at the relation between the zonal wind and the um, uh, uh, sea surface temperature. Rather than give you a long theory of how we did it, I'm just going to give you an example of what we did for the digits. So, here, uh, well, well, sorry, one step more still. You might say, well, your causal variable can be any size, but it's not, you know, can be any feature of, of uh, your micro level uh, variables, but that's not quite right. So here's an example, a historical example, actually, um, where total cholesterol was thought to be a cause of heart disease, but then it was later found that total cholesterol was made up of HDL and LDL, happy, well, high density lipids and uh, low density lipids, or happy lipids and lousy lipids. Uh, <laughs> Uh, HDL having a positive effect on, actually I think these days they think HDL has no effect anymore on heart disease and LDL has a negative one. And so the problem of course in this setting is that if you think total cholesterol is the relevant causal variable, if I tell you increase your total cholesterol by three units, that's actually ambiguous to, with regard to the proportion of HDL versus LDL, right? So if you don't know that HDL and LDL are the relevant causes, then uh, increasing total cholesterol, uh, you might have a negative effect on heart disease, where I was hoping that you'd have a positive effect on heart disease. Okay, so there is a sense in which the aggregation here, if I go to total cholesterol, has over-aggregated the relevant, has aggregated above the relevant causal um, uh, coarseness. Okay, we've developed a theory to try and avoid this type of problem, to really handle those cases like the El Nino and the um, um, a digit recognition case, and I want to show you the digit recognition case as a kind of proof of concept. Here's, here's how we did it, or, or here are the results, I suppose. The question was, what are the visual causes of recognizing the digit seven? Here are a whole bunch of handwritten digit seven. And we did a whole pile of studies on Amazon Turk, where people were supposed to write down the numbers that they saw, and uh, question marks if they couldn't see any number. And now I'm claiming that I know, or my machine knows, the causes of you recognizing a particular digit as that digit. Now the question is, how do I prove that to you? And our thought was, we'll prove it to you like this. We'll say we have a starting digit, zero to nine, on the left-hand side, and we will, we will say that our machine knows the causes of your digit recognition, if it can manipulate these digits minimally, such that you say it's the target digit. 
Okay? So, I, this is an, uh, up for dispute if you don't like it, but so uh, the, the proposal is that my machine knows the causes of your digit recognition if it can manipulate any handwritten digit to any other handwritten digit. That's the thought, and that you agree with its uh, manipulation. So, I'll show you the result and you can judge for yourself. These were early results. So, the thought is we wanted the 9 manipulated to a 0 in a certain minimal way. You know, squint a bit and you might approve of it more. I think we didn't succeed so well on um, maybe the 4 or the, the somewhere down here. But there are others that are more plausible. So, the 8 to the 1. And you see here for the 7 to the 2, it preserves a lot of the uh, structure that was there in the original image. So the thought is that we have now, I, I would have to tell you a lot more about the details, a machine that, given a whole bunch of training, can manipulate images of digits from any arbitrary handwritten digit to any other. And given that we can do it and to the extent that you agree with the success of the output, uh, which I agree is not perfect in all cases, then uh, uh, you should, uh, our, our suggestion is that you should then agree that we know what the causes are, even if we can't give a two-line definition of it. Here you see some of the work that happens along the way in how it started manipulating, uh, how, how our machine started manipulating the digits. Okay, similarly for the equatorial Pacific, we, we used basically the same algorithm to try and find uh, uh, the El Nino, and what we took as the ground truth was here's a chart of occurrences of El Nino and La Nina, the uh, uh, opposite cold phenomenon in the Pacific over uh, uh, the last five or six decades. And um, the question was, did our machine automatically, without telling it uh, that there were El Nino years, did it succeed? And it turns out that this particular pattern, or this is a representation of the kind of pattern that it finds, is strongly occurring in exactly the peaks that uh, were El Nino years in the past. And so I have a, this is of course just a, an image to illustrate the point, that we have a proper quantification of how well it, it managed to detect that. But the, the result is that in an unsupervised way, without telling the machine anything about when there were El Nino years in the past, it detected a phenomenon, a macro-level climate phenomenon, that corresponds exactly to what we have called El Nino, and similarly for El Nino. Okay, so finally then, I'm sorry I went over a little. Uh, my work, I like to think of it as sitting kind of in the uh, middle of, of these types of disciplines, and that's why causality never has a home and somehow has a home everywhere. Uh, but it's, it's really something that uh, benefits from the input from all these disciplines and probably many more. And so, thank you for having me.